Hello and welcome to Transformative Travel. I'm your host, Gary White, and I'm here in Evera, Portugal with my wife and co-host, Ellen Aviva. Hi, Ellen. Hi. How are you doing? We uh, have a, a uh, heat wave going on here, so Ellen has decided to come inside. She's been outside for, mod for most of these, but... Uh, uh, she's now inside where it's a little bit cooler. You're right. It's 95 out and I think 73 in here without the air conditioning because oh. this building is so old. The walls are so thick. And you can see behind me some of the painting on the walls from the night that has been redone from the 19th century. And behind me too. Yeah. 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 Well, today we have a very special guest. Uh, tell us about Marchine. Yes, Marcin Renstra okay. is a multifaceted author, uh, artist, I think, I think you're going to have to start again because what? you were frozen for a second. So, oh, I think the heat is impacting our uh, internet service, so you'll have to bear with us, everyone. All right, let me start again. Marcin Renstra is a multifaceted author, artist, traveler, pilgrim, and groundbreaking minister. Born in Rangoon, Burma in 1941 to medical missionary parents en route to India, she grew up in what is now Pakistan, went to boarding school near Tibet, and served in an orphanage in Nigeria. She married, moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and had four children. And then she and her husband and their four children returned to Nigeria and Ethiopia to do medical service before returning to Michigan, where they have lived ever since. Marcin was the first female Master of Divinity student at Conservative Calvin Seminary and was the first woman senior pastor in the Reformed Church. And she later went on to an interfaith seminary and was ordained as an interfaith minister. And I'm so eager to learn more about these transformative processes. She was involved in establishing an interfaith institute in Ganges, Michigan. She has served Reformed Church, Presbyterian, Unity, and interfaith congregations. Her books include a feminist reading of the Psalms, a young adult magical fable, other books about feminine spirituality, and much more. We are excited to talk with Marcin about her passion for feminine empowerment and universal spirituality, and her transformative pilgrimage and Native American shamanic experiences. Remember, there will be time for Q&A at the end, and if you have any questions before then, please enter them into the chat box area. And by the way, if you want to contact Marcin, send an email to us at powerfulplaces at gmail.com and we will forward your message to her. So, are we ready? Hi, Marcin. Hi. Here we go. All right. Hi. Uh, oh, it's so good to see you. You do. And if you have joined us live, uh, type your name in and where you're located, and I'll put some of those up on the screen as we go. Okay. All right. I think she froze again. Uh, so am I frozen again? No, I think yeah. Well, we, we're, having we're having some technical difficulties, but uh, our, so it is. I'm okay. 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 Anyway. Okay. Uh, Ellen is coming in and out a bit here. So I feel that way these days. So just bear with me as I trans <laughs> as I transit from one realm of reality to another. I'm sorry that this is happening. Okay. I'm on Gary's iPhone as a hotspot because there is no internet in this back room. Uh, but it looks like it's full on, so 
we'll just keep going. Okay. How about this? Okay. So this first picture we chose because, well, Marcin, you can tell us. You're, this is your father? Yes. And where are you? And uh, you are, we're what, in, two years old? Um, yeah, about two. We're in Taxila, uh, India at that time because this was in the early 40s before <clears throat> the partition of India. And um, my dad's a doctor, and he was teaching me how to use a stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> and was what, a, why was your family there? Um, my mom and dad were an, a doctor and nurse, and they both felt a call uh, from their Christian tradition. They felt that God was calling them to serve people who had no other medical care, uh, where there was a great need. And um, the United Presbyterian Church uh, welcomed them as medical missionaries to go to India um, at a very, very crucial time in its history during the war for independence and then the partition into India and Pakistan. So they were very devoted to um, helping people in um, dire physical uh, medical straits and did so for many, many years. My dad's motto for his life was go wherever you're most needed. Ah, that's a good motto. And this? Um, that's me a little older, but still uh, under five. And I, I have a lotus. I'm sitting on a lotus leaf and holding the blossom. This is in Kashmir, which before India and Pakistan uh, came to be, um, was a, a, a vacation place where missionaries would go, particularly the moms and the little kids because of the very hot, uh, summers in that part of, of uh, India. And this particular place we would go was um, Dal Lake, which was a beautiful lake in the area of Srinagar. And um, the lake was filled with lo lotus blossoms along the shore, which I dearly loved. Of course, it's a wonderful symbol. Yes. And th that's my family, my mother and my father. I'm between them. And I have two brothers and a sister who you see pictured there in front of our house in Sialkot, which was the last place we lived before mom and dad uh, left their service in India and went to Africa. You commented on how, although there wasn't much funding for the missionaries or the, or the medical missionaries, that mm -hmm. you were able to live in what had been a British official's home. So it was quite yeah. spacious. It, yes, yeah. it was spacious and very nice. And there we are standing on the front steps in um, Pakistani garb, which I wore often as a kid, and I still like it. It's very comfortable. So I'd like to pause just for a second and, and ask you, so what, what was that like? I mean, you're, you know, you, you knew you were not Pakistani, you're wearing the clothes of the region to, to fit in to be comfortable. Uh, can you tell me, you, you said something when we were talking about this, when I said, what was it like? And you said, well, it's what you knew. So it didn't seem yeah. different. Right, right. That's right. And it, we took it as children do for granted because that's, that's what we knew. And, and um, the, 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 the Pakistani and Indian people loved the fact that our family often wore their dress because not, not all missionaries or white people did that. Um, there was a, a subtle but very real superiority running around the place at the end of the British Raj, <laughs> and um, they and in, they they knew it, and um, I think that my parents were particularly sensitive and taught us to be to um, de deploring that and doing everything consciously possible to treat them as full equals and. Um, and I knew the la I grew up speaking the language, and I would often correct my parents' oh. pronunciation. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> well, because yeah. I grew up with it, they didn't. You know, that's right. right. And, right. and you know that, that what it felt like was um, there's a, a sociologist given people like me. It's called global nomad. It's where you're born and raised in a country different than the passport country of your parents, where they grew up. And so you end up feeling not completely as I did. I, I knew I wasn't one of the Indians and Pakistanis in many ways, 
mm-hmm. because we weren't, you know, we were we were from another land, right? Mm-hmm. Although that felt like home to me. But when I got back to the States on furlough and then later, I never felt like I belonged here either. So global nomads don't feel like they really belong anywhere, but then they also belong everywhere. everywhere. Mm-hmm. So it's two sides oh. to that coin. Right. So I'm, going to inter- a- I'm going to interrupt for just a moment. We have some people who are saying hi. hello. Hi, uh, Lindsay. Lindsay's looking oh, in. Hi. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, here's one who's oh, saying. Hi, Celia. Hi. And here's a third. Oh, oh, Lillian's got her. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> oh, great. Anyway. I, I'm so interested in this because that's a thread I want to. You know, I'm an anthropologist by training, so I'm, I'm always curious about these things. And I also studied in the, in, for, for the ministry. I went to a seminary uh, and uh, sort of, and I- Okay, she's a lot cutting in and out again. Work with my religious settings. So I'm really curious. I'm really curious how this all feeds into your lifetime because in Pakistan, your parents were medical missionaries. You were Christian. Um, mm-hmm. with the Presbyterian Church, but you were in an area that was was Muslim. Yes. Yeah. And 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 it was Hindu before that, Hindu and Muslim. Um, mm-hmm. I think the I think the, the, the profoundest um shaping of, of my attitudes about religion and so was my experience in Woodstock school, the boarding school I went to from age ten to to fourteen and a half, which That's was the next in photo. Yeah. And, and I went, and so here I had as my classmates, and they weren't just classmates, because when you are in a boarding school, you are with your classmates and everyone else in the school 24 seven. So mm-hmm. I spent a lot more time with them than with my own siblings over a period of years. And they were from all over They you know, different religions, different countries. It was a very interfaith, uh, cross-cultural, inclusive, diverse, open kind of place. And even though its history was rooted in the Christian um, community that founded it, it was, it, w- it was ecumenical and then open to people of all religions and races from early on. In fact, they celebrated their 100th anniversary when I was there. And so the, I, I, so I've always carried that experience with me, and the experience of long talks while hiking in the mountains with my Hindu friend Suniti Nam Joshi and and my uh, Chinese friend Helen Pung, fondly called Ping Pong, and um, maintained those friendships for a long time. And Woodstock, you went from age ten to fifteen, is not Woodstock in. The U.S. No, no, it's, no, it's, it's, right. it's near the Himalayas, right? It's near Tibet. It's the up in the, Tibet. it's in the foothills of the Himalayas, mm-hmm. 7,000 feet up and roughly 50 miles from Tibet and very close to the major pilgrimage route going to the source of the Ganges to Gangotri. Which we have a photograph a little later, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yes. you went back on a 43 union, which we'll get, get to in, in, <laughs> Further, I've tried to organize the slides um, chronologically, though I want to talk about topics, but just to sort of get us through. And this is, we fast forwarded now. I mean, mm-hmm. in the previous picture, you're 10 to 15. Now you are married and you married uh, the man you met while you were doing service in an orphanage in Nigeria, correct? And here you mm-hmm. are, now you have four children. Mm-hmm. So we're, and we're, we're back at the very same, that's photos taken in front of the very same house where my parents lived and where John and I met 10 so years John, earlier. So 10 years earlier, John came to Nigeria. Where John was in Nigeria were. and we met there. Yeah. yeah. He was, and he was serving between his junior and senior year in medical school. And he was serving as a medical he missionary? Had, Nope. Um, he, no. he was in medical school and he had won a Smith Klein and French fellowship to study tropical me- medicine in an underdeveloped country. And my dad happened to be his sponsor and mentor. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> and we were both from Grand Rapids, but had never met <laughs> until uh, Nigeria. <laughs> okay. So here you are, and this is the early 1970s, and you have four children, and you're back mm -hmm. in Nigeria for three months? Um, no. Something uh, like? Yeah, about three months, three to four months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To the, great, to the great delight of some of the nurses in, at the hospital who remembered uh, John and I's romance 10 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I homeschooled the kids while John helped my dad in the hospital. <laughs> what about this okay, one? Now, this is a, a complete change of, of scenery. We, we have you with four kids. You've been in Nigeria, you've been in Ethiopia, you're back in, I think, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And here you are behind uh, the pulpit. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us about what's going on, what's, what's happened? Well, when I, my mother tells me when I was little, um, I used to play with blocks and I would um, make, uh, make the temple from a picture in a Bible story book, you know, with the holy, holy, holy of holies in the holy place and the outer courts and everything. And that fascinated me. Why? I don't know. But she says that I talked about being a minister that early. Um, but at, at the years that followed made it very clear to my observation uh, that women, at, in my experience and in the churches with which I was familiar, uh, there were no women ministers. They weren't allowed to do that. And they would quote certain verses from the Bible to prove it. Um, and I think that because of that, my that early dream of being a minister, because I thought nothing would be more wonderful than sharing good news with people, um, it, it went underground. And what blew it back into life was when we were in the Air Force in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where actually this was taken, and I, I was chosen because I was the president of the Protestant women of the chapel to speak at a, a, a Protestant service one Sunday. And afterwards, the general's wife who attended said, you should be a minister. My teenage son listened for the first time ever. And, and I said, oh, but women can't do that. And she says, oh, nonsense. The, the Methodist church has been ordaining women for years. And so that really, you know, the spark the spark became a flame then, and um, and I nursed that flame for a long time until <laughs> until May 20 of 1979 when I was ordained as a Presbyterian minister because the Christian Reformed Church, whose seminary I attended, wouldn't ordain me um, or any woman. So you were the first, uh, this is another one of your first, you were the first mm -hmm. woman to go to the Calvin Calvin's Theological Seminary, yeah. Theological the first woman to, to do attend in the Master of Divinity program. Uh -huh. there so were, they let there you were, in. But they yeah, they thought I would make it. I, sure, it would be good training to be a good Bible teacher at Christian High. Uh, uh, <laughs> I said, no, no, that's not what my call is. <laughs> uh, so, and you said at the beginning, you know, what gave me the persistence? And I think it was because I had a series of experiences, which we don't have time to talk about now, which led me to a very, very deep conviction um, that this was what God wanted me to do with my life, and um, or at least a big part of it. And there was a verse in uh, Isaiah, you know, the, it's in the Messiah. In fact, you know, the crooked shall be made straight and the rough place is plain. Yes. Uh, and that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you, no, honey, stop with the photos for a little bit. Okay. Because I want to <laughs> pursue this some more. Because okay. this is this to me is fascinating. I mean, you grew up in in fairly conservative, traditional Christian background family, mm -hmm. and you went to a conservative seminary. Only and, because it was the only one in town. And you had kids. <laughs> and I had kid, four kids. Yeah. But you and had John was in practice there. But you had a supportive husband who. who yes, I did. He's always been very supportive. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And so even then, his dad, and and who was a Christian reform minister, even his parents, uh, as well as my parents, I never had any close family member give me anything but support ever. 
even though I was blazing a new trail and I know that they got some real flack from their family and friends about it. So, you know, I, I went to seminary, I went to um, a Methodist seminary. Uh, I left school of theology in Denver. I grew up Unitarian Universalist. Um, and uh, that was one of the many different denominations at the at Iliff School of Theology. But in my tradition, women had been ordained since I don't know how long. I mean, it was one of the first denominations to ordain women. Of course, they gave them the outlying <laughs> uh, congregations, uh, but uh, they did ordain them from the beginning. Uh, so I, I listened to the story of, wow, you know, that, that you had this determination and this conviction that this was your calling. Well, and I'll never forget the day that when I was a senior at Calvin Seminary and I had gone through all the steps of officially petitioning the General Synod, which represented the whole denomination, to allow me to be, uh, uh, to go, to be available for call as a minister. And, and I was getting discouraged. And a group of, of my friends and supporters took me out to lunch and gave me the Esther story. And the Esther story, you might remember, is where Queen Esther is sternly confronted by her uncle Mordecai when this big threat to the Jews comes. And he looks her in the eye and he says, who knows whether you are not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Whoa. And, oh, <laughs> so so they, yeah. they, they looked me in the eye and said that. And they said, and who else if not you? Mm. Mm because mm. I had this kind of support and resources and fortunately was able to do very well in seminary. And, and, uh, and the Presbyterian church locally provided me with opportunities to practice preach in the summers, which I wouldn't have had any other way. And so I uh. was able to fulfill every requirement. Uh. So there was, there was no way they could say no based on anything I didn't do or didn't do well or anything. It, it had to boil down to, well, because you're women and women should be silent in the church. And then I, how, would, just how, say, I would just say, well, Jesus said you should, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Aren't we your neighbors? Oh. <laughs> and would you want to be treated this way if you were us? <laughs> so... So they turned you down on what grounds? That the Just, Bible that the, that the, Bible, the Bible said women should women be silent should... in the church because there was one verse like that. Well, we know it's been redacted, and those things were oh, added in. They well, see so, that. But we won't, we won't oh, go there. Yeah, that's way too <laughs> liberal. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! You know the picture of you at the po at the the um, uh, preaching for that first time. I, I told you when we were we were uh, talking about this earlier. I said the first time I preached because I served First Universalist Church in Denver as an intern minister for a year and a half or so. And the first time I, we didn't have a podium, a podium like that, but the first time I got up there, I was like, oh, this is definitely not my calling. <laughs> I'm not doing this. I mean, I did for a year and I got more comfortable, but I didn't, I didn't have that experience that you did of, mm -hmm. yes, this is what I am called to do. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, I, and I think oh. if you're going to face a lot of opposition and break new ground, you have to have that kind of an inner conviction. And you have to have the kind of support that I had from family and friends. And, and so, yeah, so you were, you weren't ordained by your, your church. No, but by the Presbyterians. You, then, you were ordained by the Presbyterians. Yes. And you served a Presbyterian, I'm looking at my notes here. Yeah. Uh, you served a Presbyterian church for a while, and then you became... Then I was called from that. I started a new church. That's what they called me to do, the Presbyterians. And then about five years in, I was called by Hope Church in Holland, Michigan, to be the senior pastor of their church. And ha they had had... Ne you were the first female senior pastor in, in that denomination. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So. And you, you, uh, you served that church for some five years, during which you were selected to travel with the World Council of Churches yes. to China. Yeah, that was that was a wonderful experience. It was right after the end of the Red Guard Revolution when China was starting to 
open up and allow people to go back to their houses of worship or temples or mosques. And the World Council of Churches wanted um, the opportunity to bring a group of people there to to be to see that happening. It was very moving to, to go to uh, uh, an old Christian church in Shanghai and see people in the pews with um, tears going down their faces as they once again sang and together, finally able to be together after having to go underground for so long. And Buddhist temples, same thing, mm -hmm. you know, only people lighting incense and bowing and so happy to be back in their places of worship to be able to be free to do that. Um, we, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the places we went in China were just gorgeous very impressive <laughs> no that was a wonderful trip and and then you left your ministry you had a bout of breast cancer yes and you were telling me that that was the trigger for you to to leave what was i suppose a fairly intense experience as senior the yeah. first female senior minister it, yeah, it was it was very rewarding, and I and I enjoyed it. And at the same time, I was the token woman on everything, and it was, um, you know, very high expectations and lots of pressure. And um, at that time, I had also started getting serious about dream work and um, about listening to the voice of the spirit of the Holy Spirit in various ways. And I felt strongly that that breast cancer incident was a wake up call, which said mm -hmm. I need to make some big changes in my life if I wanted to survive and keep living and keep following whatever path God was laying out for me. So it was a very, very tough decision. Um, but in the end, uh, I took it. And because I took it, um, I had the freedom to write the book Swallow's Nest um, about using feminine language for God, which by that time I was really sensitive about. <laughs> There's nothing like spending a lot of years in in the traditional church um, to realize how very influenced it is by patriarchy. Uh, and and if if the only language you use for God is masculine, that privileges the masculine in a way that is, I found, I, I found unacceptable. Um, and Swallow's Nest is really my p paraphrase of the Psalms um, using feminine language, not only for people, but God. And Erdman's, yes. Erd which is a public publishing company in Grand Rapids was good enough to step out into lots of controversy and take a big chance and publish that book. Wow. This was published in the 90s? Early, yes. 90s? Early 90s. Early 90s, yeah. Yeah, that's that's when I was in, in seminary, and I ah, remember okay. having similar arguments at the, with the, uh, yeah. the, you know, Methodists. Yeah. Some of them are very liberal and some of them are not. And uh, yeah. when I was doing chaplaincy training, uh, you know, I got kind of tired of the, the masculine language. And there was, even though I grew up as a Unitarian without a clear God image, and I would have thought, I do not have this male you know, thing in the sky with a beard, because that's not how I grew up at all. I grew up in a humanist family. Um, I realized how ingrained it is, how masculine yeah. languaging really well, constrains how you perceive yourself as a woman absolutely. in this context. And you know, the reason that Erdman's published that in the end, the editor-in-chief, Jan Pott, was, had looked at my manuscript and he wasn't going to publish it. He gave it to his assistant, Ina Van Diziano, at lunch hour and said, look at this and tell me what you think. And she looked at it and burst into tears oh. because she said, and told him, said, for the first time, like she read Psalm 8, Oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have made women just a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor and put all things under their feet. And she went, whoa. 
Um, wow. So, wow. And, and that convinced Jan Pot that it needed to be published. Oh, wow. And these books, your books, by the way, are still available on Amazon. Yes, fact, I'm going to go are. out and buy that. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, I remember those times because I mean, we got into real trouble with the Sufi community at that time too. It's a long story, which I'm not going into, but the languaging is so important. How you call people and right. how you are limited, how even when I thought I wasn't influenced by this because of my upbringing, when I shifted the languaging from masculine to feminine, it was like, oh, oh, I'm included. Yep. I'm yes. included. It, it, it's just radically exactly. different. That's exactly I right. I didn't grow up in the, the Christian patriarchal system that you did. And so I can, that's one reason I'm so, I wanted to talk to you so much because. But I bet I'm your so hymn book your still ability. had that. Your hymn book still had, this is my father's well, we world and so on. We, we didn't have hymn books. We didn't have okay. hymn books. Oh, okay. Unitarian, <laughs> I mean, Unitarians um, are a different sort, let's say. <laughs> yeah. But, but even so, the languaging is there. Yeah, yeah, languaging is there. And it's still an issue. So it is anyway. because it's in but, our larger culture still. But um, your books are available. They're still available. And we saw some comments from people that Gary was putting on about, <laughs> I don't know if you saw them, but uh, about how, how wonderful they are and full of spirit. So uh, they're still there and they're still influencing. Your book was a cosmic earthquake and made an <laughs> opening for all women, says Lindsay McKenna. Well, Lindsay, you, I remember you said when I gave you the book and you first read it, and you said, whoa, that's a shot across the bow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, but that's, <laughs> well, I, I, ha I still laugh when I think about that. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to... So you have resigned from the active ministry. You have mm -hmm. written this book and these other books that we've been showing. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, you help start an interfaith institute or you start an interfaith institute at a nearby ashram in Ganges, Michigan. Can you say something about how that, that came about? Um, well, I, I had already uh, with my friends, Ghazala Munir, who's Muslim, and Lillian Siegel, whose daughter... Uh, said hi at the beginning of the program. Um, we had started together with some other uh, women and men in Grand Rapids, the Interfaith Dialogue Association, finally known as IDA. <laughs> and they had a yearly conference at which they would have top-rate speakers, world-class like Houston Smith and Leonard Swidler. Oh, wow. And um, at one point, I, uh, someone they had uh, scheduled for their yearly conference could had to back out at the last minute, so they asked me if I would speak. So I did, and at that, in the audience were uh, Mataji Gorima and Swami Tapasananda and Swami uh, Baba from uh, Mother's Trust, Mother's Place, which is which is the place in Ganges, the ashram, and they uh, summoned me to meet with them and asked if I would help them start an interfaith institute there. And I said, yes. And that led to the opportunity for me to go to the uh, all faith seminary in New York city, which then equipped me to be able to begin an interfaith institute, which would offer cert certification to those who took it so that they could lead interfaith communities as well. Well, you come a long way from, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it but it felt like coming home because um every Sunday there would be a community gathered and we would honor a different faith every Sunday we would have its music and someone from that faith would give a talk about their faith and then there would be a potluck lunch with a discussion of it afterwards and sometimes there would be something else from that the culture of that people whether it be dance or music or whatever and it was just a a very interesting rewarding experience so all of your your experience when you were growing up and all of that is just sort of it took that's right. here it, it is it's yeah. it makes you see how uh as shakespeare once said you know uh, uh there is a providence that shapes our lives mm -hmm. rough hew them as we will right 
and and uh, and that I experienced being at the ashram and being part of that effort as a culmination of my years in India at Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. I sort of see mm -hmm. this. Yeah, like underground, like it's under the soil, and it's just sort of waiting to come forth. And then, yeah, like and an underground this, river, this yeah, blossoming. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Speaking of Woodstock. Oh yeah, I'm looking <laughs> for time here. Okay, there you are. This is your 40th reunion in yeah. 1998. Yeah, I'm in the front row in, in the red. <laughs> yes, and then, and that's those are my classmates. And this wow. is 40 years after we graduated from Woodstock School and a whole group of us were able to meet in India, take a tour. And this is of course the Taj Mahal and we visited some other marvelous places and then went back to the actual campus of Woodstock School and sat in the same dining room where we used to eat and hiked on the same trails we mm. used to hike um, and had an absolutely wonderful experience. I've always been to me, the Himalaya mountains are the most beautiful place in the world. And I just look at the snow covered peaks and I feel like uh, I'm in the presence of God in an, a more intense way than any other time. And would be, I used to dream for years and years after I left India at age 15, I would, I would dream of being back there. But I would never get to see the mountains. There would always be something in the dream that interrupted it. And once I actually went back and could just soak up their beauty and the divine presence that they that they communicated to me, I never dreamt that the dream stopped. Mm -hmm. So my soul you know, had been longing for it all that time. And we're going to get back to the idea of the, the power of the land fairly soon if I can. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm watching the time. And I want to make sure we spend time on the power of the land and walking the land. And I can see that speeding into this as well. So this picture is, you said this was the pilgrimage route to the source of the Ganges. Yes. And those and are the our, Himalayas in the back. And you're on yeah, that path. Yeah. You can't tell, but way up ahead. <laughs> but that was a, a wonderful experience. It was part of our, and that, that peak way, way against the sky that you can hardly discern against the clouds is, is where they say Shiva, God Shiva lives and meditates and meditates the world into existence. Mm -hmm. And from there, the Ganges flows to water the whole of India. Well, wow. part of it. Mm -hmm. wow. So pilgrimage is a, a, an important thing to me. I love, and we're gonna I love the get idea to that and doing soon. it. Yeah. Well, and for me too. I mean, the Camino has been part of my life. Right. Since you, you guys 1982, are. 1982, <laughs> 1981. Yeah. 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 And here we are just behind the Church of Santiago with the scallop shells marking and yellow arrows marking the way for the Camino in, in Portugal going right by our house. So wow. We say, pretty, we say we're always on the Camino. On the Camino. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Um, and when we we have some pictures of you on the Camino de Santiago, so I'm let's let's keep going and we'll get to that soon. Okay. Uh, wait, there's a no. Wait, back up, back up. There was a picture of the Ganges in the mosque. There we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is just a beautiful picture. Yeah. Uh, and okay. One of, and, one of the big ways that that influenced me growing up there in a Muslim country was that every single day hearing the call to prayer five times. Yeah. It yeah. just kept you constantly aware and of how important prayer is and of the presence of God. Yep. Here's another comment. Lillian Siegel. Oh, that's my friend Lillian with whom, with whom <laughs> we started the interfaith dialogue. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And then we're going to, we have pictures of the books you've published, which we can just go through very quickly. Okay. So that I'll we can get, get on to it. more interesting, not interesting, sorry, but more immediate topics that I want to talk to before we run out of time. Sure. Okay. Books. Come to the feast. Um, this is oh, I wrote that book when I taught. I when, Besides being at the, at the at Hope Church, I also during those years taught at Western Theological Seminary. And I taught a book on spiritual formation. And uh, uh, I mean, a course, and I couldn't find a book that said the things I 
need, wanted to teach, so I wrote it. Wonderful. So this was really written for, but in a for a broader audience too. It was it's a, it's very ecumenical, and it talks about all the ways in which our souls are fed, um, in in very diverse traditions. Great. And next, this um, one, the future for women. Yes, I I wrote that with my friend uh, Donna uh, Leonard. She did the il wonderful illustrations, and this was in that this was inspired by the uh, twelve step program. But mm -hmm. this is a nine step program, and and uh, and it's meant to be used by groups of women as a process by which they empower themselves. Wow! wow. In the same way that the twelve steps do, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so um oh. that yeah that and okay. and we we used it i used that book in with groups of women here in michigan quite a few times isha search wonderful. is just a novel wonderful. oh just a novel <laughs> i read it it's not just a novel it's a multi-layered wonderful magical fable yeah, it's, it's quite marvelous yeah, it's, okay it's, it's, yeah thank you yeah that's it's uh it was it was inspired by the process of active imagination, which I owe to Jung and to mm -hmm. my good friend, Eni Bykirk, who, with whom I did uh, dream work therapy when I was going through cancer. She just uh, made her transition, just passed mm -hmm. on, and I owe her a huge de uh, debt of gratitude. Hey, yeah, Ruth, that's moment. right. Yeah, yeah Ruth, uh, we did. We, you, you gave us a space to, to meet for the women's group, well. yep. Okay, next. I think that's it. Uh, that's then we're the, on to Egypt. Uh, Egypt briefly, but you know what? We're running out of time. So I'm going to skip Egypt. You just skip why Egypt. Just say, why, why, I, mean, I love Egypt. Why don't you just say something very briefly? This was an interfaith journey you took? Yes, this was an interfaith pilgrimage sponsored by the Coptic Center in Grand Rapids. And I was allowed to go along. And um, again, that was a wonderful a uh, broad interfaith experience. Okay, next we're getting closer to the land. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, yes, uh, you cut out a little bit there, but. Okay, this, okay. Is, this um, is you playing the flute and there's another one. And are we back in, are we in Sedona yep. here? Yes. Okay, there you are. So yeah. I want to know how we got from Egypt and Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and all of that to playing the flute in Sedona, Arizona. Well, it began at the Interfaith Ashram, uh, Mother's Trust, and um, the leadership there uh, heard about a, a woman, um, Eileen uh, Nauman, who... who uh, was a very good and powerful shaman. And so they wanted to go and investigate and they invited me to come along. And um, at the end of that trip, uh, they wanted to learn from her the red road, but she ascertained from various tests, they weren't ready, but she ascertained that I was. And so she offered to teach me the elements of the Red Road and of Native American spirituality that she knew so well. So I gladly accepted. And over the next um, years and years, <laughs> when I uh, we started coming to Sedona because I was so impressed and uh, moved by its enormous beauty and the spiritual intensity of it. And so um, began going there every winter and uh, during that time, Eileen and I would go out walking the land, and she taught me about walking the land. And um, I think one of the most influential things which would influence anybody is is the, the 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 marvelous Native American way of relating to nature that she that she models so well and and taught me. Um, and the flute's part of that. It's when you go out into nature, you go with respect and you you see th that it's full of the spirits, the spirits of the trees and the rocks and the plants and the animals and the people who live there and who did live there. Everything is alive and um, you, you offer gratitude and offer 
um, your help and, and you can ask for their help too. And playing the flute was a way of doing that. So whenever we would go out, often Eileen would play her drum and I'd play my flute. And we would, and we, she taught me various um, ways of uh, meditation and ceremony, especially the, the seven directions. And all of that was a beautiful missing piece that, that uh, rounded out my interfaith experience. Because as an interfaith minister, I had been introduced to all the, you know, classic religions, right? Buddhism, Taoism, mm -hmm. Islam, and all that, but not of the original people, not of the Native Americans. So I really feel as though I was divinely led to Sedona for probably several reasons, but one big one was so that I would have this opportunity to learn from Eileen and to go out onto the land because how you learn is by doing. And um, it's not so much book learning as it was in, in the, although a lot, the Interfaith Seminary had a lot of action too, but this was very, very important to me because nature's always been a huge part of my life uh, from the mountains all the way. And if I, if I can't be in close contact with nature, I'm not a happy camper. I, I would not make a good city person. So, and all of that, uh, resulted in another book. Wait, yeah. I want to say one thing before you talk about the book, which is, you know, uh, that we met you in basically in Sedona because mm -hmm. of Eileen, because Eileen had read some of our books on Powerful Places and mm -hmm. our book series called Powerful Places In. And uh, she invited us to come and she said she would teach us how to, to walk the land the way she knew how to walk the land. Yep. And um, we had an opportunity to experience some of that that teaching with her, and to meet you. And, yeah, because she uh, asked me if I would help. You, yes, and you took us on several mm -hmm. uh, outings where we uh, tried to model the the learning that 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 you had to offer us. Yeah, so yep. we we're grateful to Eileen for yes. walking the land, teaching Very us something. So. And she's written a book called Walking the Land that's recently yes, published. Yes, which is on Amazon and an excellent mm -hmm. book. Everything you would want to know about how to do it yeah. in your own area is uh, is in that book. Great book. Yeah. So now you can get back to the- The flood. The, the, last, <laughs> the most recent book you've published. Yeah, yeah this, one, this one is uh, uh, self-published on Amazon. Uh, Gary helped me with the formatting, bless his heart, because he's <laughs> so much better than I am at the tech stuff. It is based on the flood myth of the Yavapai people. Yavapai people are the tribe that still occupies and did occupy the area now called Sedona. And th their name means people of the sun. And like so many cultures, you'll know this, uh, Ellen, they have a flood myth, which is very common all over. And um, But theirs is so different. It features a grandmother and her grandson, which mm -hmm. is real different than Noah and the Ark. Right. And I was very right. intrigued by it. And so did the research, uh, read the books, talked to the people, and uh, let it all roil around in my mind, and then wrote this in novel form as if it were in the words of Grandmother Komwita, who was the survivor of the flood. Uh, and, um, and so it, it enabled me to bring together so much of what I had learned and put it in a story form. Um, and my hope is that, um, that it would be of some inspiration maybe to the Avapai youth and others who don't realize the treasure of their heritage. And it's available on Amazon. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and I read the manuscript. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But we are, we have about five minutes. Left Here's us. a question that has just in come in. Case there are classes or gatherings. No. Remember, <laughs> if you want to contact Marsheen, you can contact her through us at powerfulplaces at gmail.com. And we will forward your emails to her. Um, okay. I think there are two more that I want to 
to a whole nother topic that we have like five minutes for. Okay, Gary, will you move on to the Camino? Okay, so the Camino, oh. which is so dear to my heart. This is the pilgrimage road to Santiago de Compostela. There are numerous routes. The most popular one is the uh, Camino Frances that goes across Northern Spain for 500 some miles. It was a medieval pilgrimage road, maybe much more. I did my PhD in anthropology on it. I still yeah. want it. So, but anyway, and here you are. This is another connection we have. The scallop shell, which is the symbol of Venus, but that's a whole nother story, is the symbol <laughs> of, of, of the Camino, of people who are walking the Camino. And there you are walking the Camino, I think you said sort of after your 70th birthday. Yeah, and I was still 70, but barely. <laughs> and, and, and would you say something about, you know, this, the preparation and why that was important? And here you are leaving cornmeal offerings, as you have learned in walking the land to make offerings to sacred places. But tell me about what, what uh, why the Camino and, and pilgrimage? Um, well, in, in terms of the Camino, my good friend Sharon Miller um, wanted to walk the Camino and invited me to do it with her, which made it uh, more attractive and um, doable. Um, before that, I had been uh, doing uh, what I called pilgrimages at the churches I served. I, um, After um, serving some time at the Interfaith Institute, I was called to be the minister at the local Unity Church here in Douglas, Michigan. And while I was there, I led, I, I began to lead pilgrimages to Unity Village, which is the headquarters of the whole Unity movement um, in Kansas, you know, near Kansas City. Um, I had gone there alone myself to start to take classes to learn more about the Unity movement and um, found that the place, Unity Village, was very powerful energetically and beautiful. And I felt that by taking people there for a week um, or you know, a little less, but not much, um, to take classes and to walk that campus and to be in those places where the Fillmores and others who, who founded the movement had, had lived and taught would be a very powerful way of rooting them more deeply in um, that tradition, which they had embraced already. And so um, rather than just going as a tourist, to go as a pilgrim is a whole nother thing. So when you go as a pilgrim, the preparation is just as important as actually doing it because you're going for a sacred purpose. You have to search your heart to say, what is that purpose? And how are you going to express that? And what attitudes are appropriate for a pilgrim? And one of them is travel lightly <laughs> because you're going to walk a zillion, all those miles, and don't take more stuff than you need. Um, yes. Right? And a be prepared a for... Of, a pound of stuff on your back gets very heavy at the end of the day. Very. <laughs> and it, then... It, the, the metaphors of pilgrimage and what you're carrying with you, the baggage oh, that you need yes. to leave behind, that you need to cast off, the things you find you don't need. And why yes. did you ever think you did? Uh, the willingness to take the risk to, to step forward without all of that stuff, metaphorical, yes. physical, uh, emotional, historical. Right. Yeah. yeah, and to be open to what the message of the pilgrimage is and the places, the place where you are and the people you meet and, and, and to realize it, what it really does is for me anyway, and I know for others too, it really firms in one's consciousness that life is a sacred pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And that if you live it that way, it's much richer and fuller and more satisfying um, than like a tourist trip, which I think is how some people live their lives too. You know, Let's see what I can get out of it. Oh, what's the next interesting thing? Um, yeah, I have my checklist. I have my yeah, yeah. Uh, bucket list. And yeah, yeah. But instead to see it as a pilgrimage. I did that. I did this. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, and to sing and do ceremony, you know, as part of the pilgrimage was a very important part of our pilgrimage to unity. And so um, I did that same thing. I would sing certain songs as I was walking and I would leave cornmeal at certain sacred spots. And, and if I would go by, like I remember this big grove of ancient chestnut trees we walked by and it was like they were pulling me so strongly, the energy that I just walked off the trail and went and spent some time in that grove. And it was just, it was just marvelous. Um, and, and, and that was because I'd walked the land with Eileen and I had learned yeah. to, 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 that trees can become your good friends and they have messages for you, you know? I remember grandmother Cottonwood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My Oak Creek, you took right? Us you took us to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it, it really enriches your life. And I think that one of the most desperate needs of the world today is for the human race, as many people as possible, to, to, to have a, a <laughs> conversion experience about how they relate to nature. Right. It's not something mm -hmm. to be used. Exactly. You know? It's something to be respected and loved and nourished and tended and learned from. All right. So we have about five minutes. If anybody wants to ask a question, I'll put up questions. Anybody out there? And if not, I'll just keep talking until you find a question. Good. Go <laughs> but, ahead. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy because after this conversation with you, I can feel this, this, this continuity in your life mm -hmm. that that goes from this what what I thought were sort of disparate things I couldn't see how it all fit together because I didn't know, um, but from this growing up in a multicultural environment, uh, exposed to the land to the Himal Himalayas, uh, growing up with people of many different faiths, and honoring that and recognizing the significance of the the Mulein, who's who's calling people to prayer every you know five times a day, uh, and how that all flows, sort of yeah. underground, and then it starts blossoming forth as you answer your call to ministry, even though you have many challenges and uh, obstacles to overcome, mm -hmm. and then shifting from that towards uh, towards the interfaith ministry, which feels so fully expressive of who you are and the, the feminist readings and uh, empowerment. And then from that um, to the land, which is circling back to the experiences you had as a child and being close to the Himalayas. Yeah. And now mm. this, um, this little ch uh, remark by Lillian Siegel, the dear green dream group sisters, um, she and uh Sharon Miller, who, who got me uh, interested in the Interface Seminary, and three or four other women formed for more than 20 years a dream group. And we would meet every month and talk about our dreams with each other from a Jungian point of view. Um, uh, of course, uh, tweaked by the feminist point of view because we were all in the uh, feminist consciousness as well. And that was such an important group for all of us, still is. Uh, we are all separated now, um, living in one coast and the other and so on. But uh, we, used to, we used to get together in Sedona uh, for oh. dream group retreats. <laughs> um, so they'll know some of what I'm talking about. Yes. Oh yeah, so yeah, we are all related. That, Eileen. Yeah, Mitakwe Oyasin. Yeah, oh, Oyasin. yeah. And I think yeah. Eileen. Yeah, that is so true. When we look at when we look at nature that way, it makes a huge difference. And also, mm -hmm. when we look at one another, what is your current? Here's a question practice? for you. Okay. What is your current practice prayer for what? I. Uh, it didn't come through. Mm. Celia, can you say a little more? I don't see it. Well, look, I can ask. Uh, I'm not sure what Celia is asking, but you have a prayer practice. You have a meditation practice. 
Um, I, I would I would say I have a, a treasure chest of them. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, centering prayer is one. Um, dream work is and imaging meditation is another. Music for sure. Not only playing the flute, but Walking along, I, I, every morning I take what I call a blessing walk with emphasis on the syllable sing, blessing walk. And I sing a native, um, uh, what I learned was a native American chant, you know, uh, and, and also when I went to a, um, another one, when I went to a, an ecumenical conference back in the days when I was becoming more and more conscious of feminist values. And um, it, it's a song, maybe you know it, um, sing, sing, sing of a blessing, sing, sing, sing of a blessing, and then a blessing of trees, a blessing of flowers, a blessing of friends, a blessing of family, and you can just keep on then, and then at the end you sing, love will increase, a blessing of peace, oh, and you know, so, so walking and singing is a major spiritual practice, and uh, spiritual reading. Oh, sorry. But you walk, oh, you walk around drum the beach whenever you can, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, drum circle. Yeah. Ruth and I are uh, working on starting a drum circle in the area. Wow. So uh, we'll see what oh, happens. I want to live near you, Marcia. <laughs> I, I love drum circles. Oh, yes. And Eileen's drum was so wonderful. Um, Remember when she, when we we did that drumming in her hogan? Oh, oh. So great! Very powerful. Yeah. Very very powerful. Like yeah, she's a very powerful person. Yeah, and so are you. So I see we're. I'm nearly we out, out of time. time. <laughs> we have a minute or two. Anything else you want to say to wind up? Thank you, Eileen, Nataka, Yeayasin. We are all related. We are all related. All connected, yep. all interconnected in this wonderful Indra's web, uh, th this incredible interconnection of which we are all part. Yeah. And isn't and it interesting it that, we're doing, that we're doing this because of the World Wide Web? Yes. Yes. If it weren't yes. for the World Wide Web? This wouldn't be happening. We couldn't be in Portugal while you're in Michigan yeah. and be talking like we're sitting together here. <laughs> That's right. And so, you know, whatever problems uh, and improvements might be needed to the World Wide Web, it's a, it's a magical, wonderful thing because it offers a way to connect that the human race has never had before. And I'm very grateful for it. Yes. So are we. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to say as a last statement? I just want to say thank you. Just such gratitude for what you've been sharing. Well, thank you for inviting me. You've given me a wonderful opportunity to share things that are of um, value to me. And I hope that they were um, and are a gift to anybody who listens. And I think you're doing a wonderful thing with your salons. Keep up the good work. And someday I hope to interview you. Oh. We'll do that. We'll do that. <laughs> well, and, I think and Lindsay says, says grandmother's spot. Lindsay says grandmother's, grandmother's spot in her. It's the real Grand world wide web, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. There we got that right. Yeah. And well, I, I have a little song I wrote about the web. Spin your own web, sister dear. Spin your own web. Do not fear. Never let yourself be caught in another should or ought. <laughs> spin your own web, spin it now, spin your own web, you know how other people's webs will be, places where you can't be free. Oh, with those words. Oh, I, love that. I want that written. Okay, with those yeah. words, we say goodbye. Okay. We're going to have to say goodbye. And okay. we have next next week we have another salon. We have part two with uh, Peggy Moore about Egyptian and uh um, Celtic Irish spirituality and and then the, the next week after that we have a salon with Cheryl Straffen in Wales Cornwall no in, in, no, Cornwall. in Cornwall right, yes. right. Uh, who will be talking about I think about Crete and the goddess of the land and megalithic sites 
Uh, so we'll, we, we'll send out announcements. If you want okay. to be on our list, please uh, contact us, Powerful places at gmail.com can they can they click it, sign up free there on the right i don't know yeah. i don't yes oh yeah sign up free great sign up free um, <laughs> do it and yes. i want a copy of your your little ditty about the webs okay i need to plaster that on my forehead yeah, that, I, that one i made up the music and the words okay well give me right. the words inspired and, uh, by watching a spider spin its web right beautiful <laughs> Back to Literally, the yeah. Well, thank well, friends, you all. Thank we've got to say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye, thank everyone. You, <laughs> thank you for your generous spirit and sharing so much of who you are. Well, thank you thank giving you. me the chance so skillfully. Oh. Until next